So that 
that I could have a way up to Him. Jesus built a bridge, the only way He could, with only three nails and two pieces of wood. With one rugged cross, Jesus built a bridge. The Father looked from heaven to the world below and saw there was no way to claim his own so to the world his son the master builder had to go to make a way to bring God's children home. Jesus built a bridge to heaven so that I could have a way up to Him. Jesus built a bridge the only way he could with only three nails and two pieces of wood with one rugged cross jesus built a bridge with only pieces of wood with one rugged cross Jesus built a bridge there's a story about a locus, local fitness center which was offering a thousand dollars to anyone who could demonstrate that they were stronger than the owner of the place Here's how it worked. This muscle man would squeeze a lemon until all the juice ran into a glass and then hand the lemon to the next challenger. Anyone who could squeeze just one more drop of juice out would win the money. Many people tried over time, other weightlifters, construction workers, even professional wrestlers, but nobody could do it. One day, a short and skinny guy came in and signed up for the contest. After the laughter died down, the owner grabbed the lemon and squeezed away. Then he handled the, handed the wrinkled remains to the little man. The crowd's laughter turned into silence as the man clenched his fist around that lemon and six drops fell into the glass. As the crowd cheered, the manager paid out the winning prize and asked the short guy what he did for a living. Are you a lumberjack, a weightlifter, or what? And the man replied, I work for the IRS. <laughs> and there you go. Everybody in this room understands what just happened. You know, here's, a, here's an actual letter that was received by the IRS a few years ago. It says, enclosed you will find a check for $150. I cheated on my income tax last year and have not been able to sleep ever since. If I still have trouble sleeping, I will send you the rest. <laughs> We, we love tax time, don't we? Tax time is something we all look forward to, and it's just something we wait for. It's almost like Christmas, isn't it? We all dread tax time. When you receive a letter in the mail from the IRS, the first thing you're, you're thinking is probably not. It's, it's probably a thank you letter. That's probably what that is. Uh, that's what they did. They sent me a thank you letter for paying my taxes. You might think it's a birthday card. We don't think like that. We, the first thing that goes through our mind is dread how much do they want now? You know, the, that letter, IRS doesn't send any letter except to tell you we want more. So, so that's what we're thinking. We don't look forward to an audit. 
We don't look forward to, we don't want to hear a telephone call from a collection agency. We don't want to hear a collector of any kind call us. We don't want that. See, this occupation doesn't build good friendships. The IRS or tax, tax occupation doesn't build good friendships in the occupation itself. Today I want to look at this very thing. I want to look at that topic right there. Jesus dealt with tax collectors six different times in his ministry, but on this one occasion in Luke chapter 19, he does something that he's never done before. So let's look at Luke chapter 19 this morning. This is a story of Zacchaeus, and it's one, Zacchaeus is one of those stories we learn about in Sunday school when we were kids. It's that, it's that little kid story. It's that children's story. Bible story. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from going to your house today. Those are the lyrics to the song that we teach the kids. And a lot of times we look at the story of Zacchaeus as being a children's Bible story. God put it in the Word of God because there's so much truth in that story, there's a beautiful picture in the story of Zacchaeus. It's 10 verses long, but there's so much more if you look at the details of the story. The other day, my daughter came into the house running all excited. She was extremely excited. I was on the phone. She kept talking to me. I'm still on the phone. She, she's telling me, I've got to go outside. Daddy, you have to come outside. So after a while, I'm thinking, there's an emergency out there. My son's tied up in the swing set or something. I don't know what's going on. So I've, I've got to get off the phone and go see what this is. So I get off the phone. I look at my daughter, and she said, Daddy, there's a pine cone outside. You've got to see this pine cone. And I said, that, I got into daddy mode. That is what was so important that you had to, distract me from my phone call and she stood there and she put it in little kid mode little gulp as she's looking at me I said that's what was so important a pine cone and she gulped and said it's a really cool pine cone <laughs> you know she wanted me to notice the detail of what she found outside and, and by the way it was a cool pine cone it was really fascinating pine cone so she wanted me to see this pine cone. You've got to see this pine cone. Nothing else mattered. It was that pine cone she needed to see. And I'm thinking, what is so important about this little tiny thing in your life? This, something happened in your life that's so important that's enough to distract me while I'm talking on the phone. Well, why? What's so important? And that's my question this morning. What is so important? What is it that's so important? Let's read Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little, stat little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as, uh, as he also is the son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we just read the Bible. You know, there's not one time in Scripture where God tells you to read the Bible. God never told you to read the Bible. He told you to study the Bible. He told you to meditate therein day and night, but he never said just read. He wants you to dig into his word. He wants you to pull everything that you can out of his word. And he puts the details in there so you can grab them and see the truth of those details. But a lot of times we say, what, why all the details, God? Why all the details? Look at that. Look at that passage, those 10 verses. And let's look at all those details that a lot of people would say are insignificant. It says, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Nothing else is said about Jericho through the whole passage. Why tell me that you passed through Jericho? What's the significance of that? Why tell me Jericho? 
Why bring that up? Let's just take that out because it doesn't mean anything. Let's just take that out. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Okay, why do we need to know the financial status of Zacchaeus? Why do we need to know his occupation? Why is that important? Now, there is something we need to know there. There was a man. So let's just keep that part in there. Let's just keep there was a man. But all these little pesky details, let's just get those out of the way so we can get the real picture of what God's trying to tell us. And a lot of times we read the Bible like that. We just skim over the details when he wants us to stop. And he saw, in verse 3 it says, and he sought to see Jesus. Now that's important right there. Zacchaeus is seeking to see Jesus. Let's keep that. And who he was, but he, and he could not for the press because he was of little stature. Why do we need to know the height of Zacchaeus and how tall he was? Why do we need to know how many people were there and the crowd was full? Let's get those out of there. It's not important. And by the way, I hope you understand that I'm being totally sarcastic right now because every detail is important. Let's read on in verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Now, okay, so Zacchaeus climbed into a tree. Okay, for one, we don't need it. Why, why does he climb up in a tree? Why is that detail so important? And, and even deeper, why do we care what kind of tree he climbed up into? I mean, you told me he climbed up in a tree, but why tell me the kind of tree that he climbed up into? Why are the details important? So let's just go on past that. He climbed up in the sycamore tree. In verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Well, if we already got rid of the part about the tree, we don't need any of that, that he came out of the tree. So let's just take that out. And when, he saw, when they saw it, they murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a, man, with, with a man that is a sinner. Now, we do need that part. So far we have, there is a man, and he's seeking to see Jesus. And we also need to know that there's a, the man is a sinner. This is that salvation picture we're always looking for in the Scriptures. There's a man seeking to see Jesus, and that man's a sinner. So let's keep all that in there. That's important stuff. And Zacchaeus stood... And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Why do we need to know how much he gave back to the people? He gives them four times back what he took from them. Why is that important? Let's just take that out. It's just those pesky little details. Verse 9, And Jesus said unto him, This day is, the day of, this day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now that's important. Jesus came to save this man. So if we take all the details out, this is what we're left with. Let me read it. Without all those details that seem to be in the way that don't seem to mean anything. And behold, there was a man, a man that is a sinner, and he sought to see Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Isn't that what it's all about anyway right there? Isn't that what it's all about? That little passage that I just read to you without all those other details. Isn't that what it's all about? The details are important. God does not waste ink. He did not put them in there for us to just skim over and see a nice story. It paints a pretty picture. We see a little man climbing a tree and, oh, look at that, it's so nice. No, he put those details in there for a reason. It's so important. Every detail that God puts in the Bible is so important. And I want to talk about those details. Why is it so important? What is so important to bring up all those details? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray this morning that your words are heard, that as we're listening, that we're listening to the Word of God. I pray that my words are not heard, but that yours are. And Lord, I pray that if there is anything that's in the way in our life, the details that we accept in our own life, but they keep us from getting close to you, I pray that we will get those removed this morning. Please show us the magnificent grace of your salvation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at that first verse, that, that little verse that seems to be not, it's not significant at all. Verse 1, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Jericho is not mentioned anymore in this, in this passage, these 10 verses. Jericho is not mentioned again. Why tell me you're passing through Jericho? It seems like a little insignificant detail. Now, if, anybody, if you know me, you know that I like to read the Bible detail by detail, not chapter by chapter. And it takes a long, long, long time to read the Bible that way because I get stuck a lot when I read the Bible because I ask God, why? Why, why, did you, why did you mention that? Because there's got to be a reason. So I like, to, I like to pull out the details. I love to dig into the Word of God, and I encourage you to do the same. It's an amazing, God, it's an amazing book. 
God wrote an amazing book for us. So you should look at the details because there's so much in there. But he says he passed through Jericho that day. It doesn't seem to be a very exciting verse. So, but why does God tell us he, was, he passed through Jericho? Now, if you look at the setting of Jesus' ministry, we see here that Jesus is headed for Jerusalem. He's leaving his ministry, his earthly ministry behind, and he's heading for the cross in a few days. Now, he has to head through Jericho up to Jerusalem for Passover. That's the road that goes to Jerusalem. You have to go through Jericho to get to Jerusalem. But also, Jericho is an amazing place. It's called the City of Palms. That's the name they've given the, uh, the city of Jericho. This was Jesus' last time to go through the city of Jericho on his way to Passover. This is it. There are pilgrims from Galilee there and from Perea. There are priests who live there and serve there. There are traders from all lands. Remember, all of these people are coming up this road to Jerusalem for Passover at this time. This crowd is getting pretty big. Now, Jericho is a high-density trading. It's one of the high-density trading centers. There were three of those, uh, the, re the three regional tax centers in the land of Israel, the northern one being Capernaum, the central one being Caesarea, and the southern one being Jericho. Now, when I said it's a, it's a place, it's a tax center, there are three central locations where you get, you get your tax collectors. These are the big IRS agencies in Israel. These are big places. Jericho is one of them. Soldiers are there. Businessmen are there. The worst of everything, the best of everything is in Jericho. There's opportunity for people to steal right and left, and there's opportunity for those who buy and sell honestly. There's plenty for all. Whether you're stealing or earning it honestly, there's enough. God has blessed. There is a lot going on in Jericho. It is a huge place where people come, and they're coming through to go to the Passover. But it was a paradise for tax collectors. On this day, it was a jackpot for tax collectors because all of these people are coming through Jericho at this time. It's tax collectors' harvest time is what it is. You've got, you've got this amazing situation where all these people are coming through. And it's not just the disciples that are following Jesus through there. It's everybody that's followed, followed his ministry and he's collected along the way. Then you've got all these different nationalities coming in that are Jewish people coming for the Passover. They're all coming through. Now, just weeks before, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, which is just up the road from Jericho. It's in, Be it's in Bethany. All these people are following Jesus as he's going through Jericho this day. And they all have one thing on their mind. Is Jesus Christ the Messiah? that everybody's saying that he is. Is he the one that's coming to establish his kingdom on earth? Is that the Messiah? Is he the one that we've been looking for? And everybody's ready for Jesus to be this man. But Jesus didn't come to be their king. He came to be their savior, and they couldn't understand that he will come again to be king. But that time, he came to save the world. He came to be the savior. All of this is going on. Now let's meet Zacchaeus. It says in, in verse 2 there, it says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. In order to have a tax franchise, you had to buy it from Rome. So if you were a Jew and you bought a, tans, a tax franchise from Rome, you are now a traitor to the Jewish people. You're taxing the Jewish people for Roman gain. You, you are collecting money from them to go over here and give it to Rome. So you are not a friend of the Jews. Zacchaeus is a Jew. He's in the family of Abraham. He's in the line of Abraham. He is a Jew. But what he has decided to do is take up an occupation of being a tax collector. Rome would set a certain amount of tax a uh, tax gatherer had to pay. Now, whatever else you collected, you could keep for yourself. So these tax, people, these tax collectors would go out and say, you have to give this much money. Now, maybe Rome is asking for $10, but you can say we need 50 Now, they'll pay $50. Roman gets the, Rome gets the $10, and you are $40 richer. And that's what these tax collectors did. It was a perfect formula for corruption. That's what these tax collectors were all about. And there were many ways to tax people, and the people had no idea what they were supposed to pay. They would pay, as people came through, they would, they would tax them for every wheel that was on their cart, where they were pulling their produce through town. They could tax them for every wheel on the cart. They could tax them for every pro piece of produce in the cart. They could tax them for every animal that was there pulling the cart. They could tax them for anything they wanted to. There was just a certain amount that had to go to Rome. Everything else they could keep themselves. Tax collectors were hated by the Jews, and you can understand why. 
but also they could not attend the synagogues. Now, this is something as I was studying, it was an interesting thing. The Jewish tax collector was not allowed to attend the synagogue. And I, I did not know that. Why couldn't you go to the synagogue as a tax collector? It's because they, would, they see them as unclean. And anybody that would come in contact with them would be polluted also. So they see these people as sinners because what they're doing is they're using what they have to take the well-being of another person's life away from them. They are hurting another person just for personal gain. And a lot of times in the Bible, it would, it would put these two categories together. When it says sinner, it's talking about the same kind of people that would use themselves for, to get money from other people. Prostitution would fall into that category where they would use what they had to, to take the money or the livelihood from another person. And that would fall under the category of sinners. But the tax collectors were always called publicans. How many times do you recognize this phrase? Do you recognize this phrase that we hear over and over in the Bible? And he sat with publicans and sinners. They categorized these people as their own group. They could not come to the synagogue. They couldn't worship God. They were in their own category over here, rejected, unclean, and polluted. And that is where Zacchaeus is. So many times we even see Jesus being called a friend of publicans and sinners because he sat with them. And in a reality, they thought that he represented Satan. They thought Jesus Christ represented Satan because he spent so much time with the people that they thought belonged to Satan. Remember when they say he must be of Beelzebub. They, they talked about Jesus. Yes, he must be from Satan. Why? Because he spends all the time with the people that we categorize as people from Satan. So you can see what's happening here. Zacchaeus, the name Zacchaeus means innocent, pure, and righteous. Everything he is not. Okay, that's what Zacchaeus means. But why tell us the name of Zacchaeus? Why give us his name? And this is interesting. You know, we, we see Paul was beheaded. Everybody knows that Paul was beheaded at the end of his ministry. We do not find that in Scripture. We find that in church history. When we go back in church history, we see that. It doesn't mention that in the Word of God, but to follow church history back, we see what happened to Paul. He was beheaded. Peter was crucified on a cross upside down. We know that's true because we follow church history and we see when that happened, even though it's not recorded in the Word of God. Why did God give us the name Zacchaeus? Why was it important? The truth is he only named two tax collectors in all the Bible. One was Matthew. How he saved Matthew and, be, and Matthew became an apostle. The only other tax collector that was ever mentioned by name in the Bible was Zacchaeus. Why tell us his name? It is Clement of Alexandria, one of the church fathers, who says that this man Zacchaeus became a very prominent Christian leader and ended up a pastor of the church in Caesarea, later to be succeeded by none other than Cornelius the centurion. Why mention Zacchaeus' name? Because his life was completely transformed that day. And if you follow history, you can see Zacchaeus wasn't a tax collector, got saved and became a tax collector. He was a tax collector that got saved and started pointing the world to Jesus Christ, the one that saved him. Zacchaeus, why do we have his name? Because when you read a little farther, you find out what God did with this man's life. And it is important that we know that because Zacchaeus became a very, very honest man of God. From a bad life, he became a very honest man of God. Nonetheless, he was a commissioner of taxes. That means he was on the top of the pyramid. He was at the top of the pile. Anybody that would take taxes under Zacchaeus, he was the chief of the tax collectors in Jericho. So anybody, any tax collectors that were under him had to give him a piece of the pie, whatever they got. So it mentions that Zacchaeus is rich. And when it says rich, they mean he was loaded. He is rich. He has no need for anything. He is, he is rich. He's at the top of the pile. God, so God tells us where Jesus is that day. He's in Jericho. We've painted a picture there. Jericho. We've got Jericho. It's a place where all the people are coming. We've got the tax collector sitting in Jericho, ready to pounce on all these people that are coming through. So they despise these tax collectors. And then we see by name, there is a man named Zacchaeus, and he cannot get to Jesus because he's short. He's a short man. Let's look at the sinner. Let's look at the sinner. These are, these are people that everybody wanted to avoid. Let's look at the sinful lifestyle of Zacchaeus. He couldn't get away from the idea that he was a sinner who destroyed other people's lives to get to where he was. And Zacchaeus realized that. 
Because look at verse 3 with me. It says, and he sought to see Jesus. And that's not where it stops. It says he sought to see Jesus who he was. He didn't just want to see Jesus. He wanted to know more about Jesus. Who he was. And he couldn't get to him because of the press. And he was little of stature. He couldn't get through that crowd. He's a short man standing behind a crowd of people. And there were hundreds of people on that street. He could not get to Jesus. He was guilty of sin and he knew it. And there was only one person that he heard of that could ever forgive uh, that kind of a debt. And Zacchaeus understood what debt was all about. And he knew he had a debt. He knew he was a sinner. He couldn't even get close to God. He couldn't even get to the temple if he wanted to. He couldn't get to the synagogue. Zacchaeus is lost and it all hits him. There's not enough money in the world to bring me joy. I can't get enough personal gain to give me peace in my heart. But I have heard stories about this Jesus. He heals the blind. He makes the blind see. He makes the lame walk. And just two weeks ago, up in Bethany, he raised the man from the dead. And, people, and he says he forgives people of their sins. And people say, only God can forgive you of your sins. And Jesus says, you let your sins be forgiven thee. Jesus is the one that says he can forgive sins. I want to know who this guy is. So Zacchaeus really wants to know who he is. But Zacchaeus has two problems. Remember, he's in a crowd of hundreds of people, and he's short. He can't get to Christ. The second problem he has is spiritual. Our sins keep us from Christ. Our sins keep us from God. Zacchaeus cannot get to Jesus Christ. Why? Because of all the repercussions of all the sins that he's ever committed are standing right in front of him. All those people that he hurt... All those people that he robbed are standing between him and Jesus Christ and he can't get to Jesus Christ. And that's the same situation we were in. We couldn't get to God because of our sins. Our sins separate us from God. If you were to look at Isaiah 59 too, it says, but your, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Zacchaeus knows that he can't get to Jesus no matter how hard he tries. And he probably got a few accidental elbows well, as he was trying to get to Jesus. All these people hate Zacchaeus. So he probably got that occasional, oops, sorry, Zacchaeus. You know, they despise this guy. He, they hate Zacchaeus. He can't do anything. But he had to see who he was. And we know he was desperate because look at his actions. Remember, he is a dignitary of Rome, okay? They, have a, they are sophisticated people. They have an image that they have to maintain. They are sophisticated. They don't seem out of control. They have complete control. But look at what this higher dignity does in verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Zacchaeus starts to run. Now try to picture the humor in this situation. You've got a crowd all around Jesus Christ. They're following him, and, G and Zacchaeus realizes he can't get through. So what does this short little guy do? He runs ahead of the crowd. Just picture this little guy taking off in front of everybody else. He just starts running. That's not your typical dignitary way of doing things. But he just takes off running. And if that wasn't enough, look what he does next. In verse 4, it says, And he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. This little guy just takes off running down the street and starts climbing trees. And that's just not your normal image that you have from these tax collectors. First, Zacchaeus, there's, there's a couple things I want to point out here. Zacchaeus lost all concern for his own image. He just lost all concern the way the people look at him. He didn't care about what they thought anymore. He didn't care about his own image. He had to see who Jesus was. He needed to know this guy. He needed to know what Jesus is all about. So he throws away his own image. Second, he climbed up a sycamore tree. Why tell me the kind of tree that he climbed up? Why didn't you just tell me he climbed up a tree? Why tell me the kind of tree? Now those, when I read the Bible, those are the kinds of things that trip me up. And he climbed a sycamore tree. Well, why didn't you just tell me he climbed a tree? Why tell me what kind? A sycamore tree, and this is fascinating to me, a sycamore tree was also referred to as the hypocrite tree. Now, get ready to open this, this tree up here, and let's look what's inside of it, this image that God displays for us. It's also called the hypocrite tree. It's a kind of a fig tree, but its fruits are inferior to a fig tree's fruit, okay? It's more of a bitter, tasteless fruit versus the fruit that you would get off a fig tree. And it takes a long time to ripen. Sometimes you have to break it open. You have to break the fruit open to promote the ripening process of that fruit. 
Now, the tree is a perfect example of Zacchaeus' life. He climbs up into a sycamore tree. The fig tree, what does God use the fig tree as an example for all throughout the Bible? The nation of Israel is the fig tree. The sycamore tree is the hypocrite tree. It is a fig tree. But it's, a, it's like a hypocrite compared to the normal fig tree. They both produce figs. But one is inferior to the other. It's a hip, that's why they called it the hypocrite tree. Yes, it's a fig tree, but something's not right about it. It's, it's inferior to the fig tree. So they call it the hypocrite tree. Zacchaeus is a true Israelite, which is always symbolized by a fig tree. But he was as hypocritical as they came. Zacchaeus knew that he was not the person he was created to be. It finally dawns on him, I am... I'm lost. I've got nothing. All the money in the world can't bring me happiness. I'm lost. And he was broken and he didn't know how to fix it. Nothing was going to get in his way of finding out who Jesus was. Jesus had to that day take Zacchaeus. If you read the rest of the passage, he takes Zacchaeus, that fruit from the fig tree. Not ripened. You do not have a relationship with God. And he does a spiritual surgery on this piece of fruit and opens it up. And it starts ripening to the point of salvation. It is a beautiful picture of what is happening. And God says, I'm going to put a sycamore tree right there. And Zacchaeus, you're going to climb that tree that the world knows is a hypocrite tree. And I'm going to paint a picture right there of your life just because you're going to climb a little tree. The details are so important. They are so important. Let's look at the Savior. In verse 5, it says, When Jesus came to the place... He looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Now, Jesus Christ just called him by name. Now, that would throw me for a loop. Remember, he wants to see Jesus and find out who he is. He doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. But Jesus stops at the tree and calls him by name. Hey, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come on down and hurry up because I must go to your house. Can you imagine what was going through the minds of all those people that day? Okay, for one, how did Jesus know this guy's name? Why did he stop under that particular tree? And why does he want to go to the sinner's house right away? What's going on? What, what, what are we missing here? What's going on? Because Jesus was God in search for a sinner. That's what Jesus was doing as he was going through the streets of Jerusalem. Everybody else is headed to Passover. Jesus is looking around for a short guy running around in the street. Jesus has a different agenda than everybody else has got going on right now. Jesus has his eye. Who was searching who? Was Zacchaeus searching Christ or was Christ searching for Zacchaeus? God always searches for us. This whole thing was laid out. Christ was looking for Zacchaeus. He says, I want you to come and I want you to come down. He says, I must. It was his sense of urgency. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There's always an urgency with God. He says, Zacchaeus, you've got to come down right now. I, want, I need to save you. Today's the day, Zacchaeus. Your whole life has led up to this point right here. Today, I came down from heaven. I was born of a virgin, laid in a manger. I was born, I, was, I grew up in my life, and all my life has been leading to this point at this time, to this moment that you're about to experience. I'm heading to the cross, but before I get there, I want to see a little guy in a sycamore tree. I have an appointment that is, uh, needs to be met. There is a little guy somewhere. He's around here somewhere. He's going to climb a tree, and I need to talk to him personally because Zacchaeus, today is the day of salvation. He, God looks for us. He's searching for us. He's laid out the whole picture for us. He lays out every, every circumstance that comes into our life. He's trying to draw us closer to him. And that's exactly what he's doing with Zacchaeus here. Zacchaeus was the only one in the crowd that day that understood true grace. Because at, we don't know what happens while they're in the house together. But we do know what happens what's outside the house when Jesus and Zacchaeus are inside. It says in verse 7, and when they saw it, they murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Everybody outside the house is like, why is he in there with the person that's unclean? Zacchaeus is the only one that's about to get a true picture of what grace is that day, and everybody else is outside missing it. Jesus Christ came to save, seek and save that which was lost. Let's look at the new man. Look at what happens to Zacchaeus here. In verse 8, it says, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, I, uh, the half of my goods I give to the poor, 
And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now let me explain what he just said there. He said he's going to give half of his income, 50% of his money and possessions he's going to give to take care of the poor people. This is right after Zacchaeus gets saved. He says, I'm going to give half of my possessions and half of my finances to take care of the poor. But not only that, Jesus, I want to take it one step farther. I want to give them four, if I've done anybody wrong, I want to give them their money back. But then I want to give them four times what I took from them. I want to give that back. What's the significance there? You know, the Jewish law back in Numbers 5, verses 6 and 7. Let me read this to you. Back in Numbers 5, it lays down the law here for a person that stole from somebody else and confesses that they did it. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, when a man or a woman shall commit any sin that men commit, to do a trespass against the Lord, and that person be guilty, then they shall confess their sin, which they have done, and he shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof, and add unto it, the fifth part thereof, and give it, unto him, uh, give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed. That means I want you to give an additional 20% back. Whatever you took from the person, I want you to give an additional 20% back. That's the law. That's what Zacchaeus should have done. He confesses that he did it. Yes, I stole it from everybody. I need to give them their money back, and I need to, adi- I need to give them one-fifth more, 20% more. But Zacchaeus says, no, I want to give back fourfold. Now, fourfold, that when, a re- when he made restitution of four times the amount of what he took from them, that's the standard in the Jewish law if a person were to take sheep or oxen, if they were to steal the livelihood of somebody else, and you did not confess it, but you were tried, you were convicted of, of theft and tried in court, and you did not come and s- confess it yourself, you would pay back four times, and that's in Exodus 22 and verse 1. You would pay that back. You know the story of David, when Nathaniel comes up to David and said, there was a man who has sheep of his own, but a stranger came to his house. And what this man did was he went to his neighbor's house, who only had one sheep, and he loved that sheep, and he took that sheep from his, his neighbor, and prepared that for a meal for the stranger that came to his house. What needs to happen, David? And David says, he will pay back fourfold. That's what David told Nathaniel. Or Nathan, he said, he will pay back fourfold. And Nathan says, thou art the man. Because what he did was he took Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. He took Bathsheba and he had Uriah killed. And Nathan says, you did that. And what did David do? He paid back fourfold. He lost four children because of what he did. That was if you didn't come forward, but you were tried in court. That was the sentence that you had to pay. And what does Zacchaeus do? He sentenced himself. I'm a sinner, and I've done what was wrong, and I will pay back. I will give half of my goods to feed the poor, and then I will pay them back fourfold because I understand what kind of a sinner I am, and that is just. Zacchaeus got saved. And he was changed. But why did it all happen? Zacchaeus is a visual aid for the most amazing message in all of time. Each detail that you see happening, can you almost see Jesus standing there in the crowd watching detail by detail? Jesus can see all ten verses where nobody else could. He knows what's already written in the Word of God before it was penned. He knows what's going to happen. Can you see Jesus in that crowd that day watching? Seeing all these people, and he looks way over there, and there's this little guy running down the hill, coming towards the crowd. There you go. That's him right there. That's Zacchaeus. Come on, Zacchaeus. As he sees Zacchaeus approach the crowd, and he can't get through, he goes, that's right. That's mankind's state right there. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is a picture of mankind. You cannot get to Jesus Christ because of the consequences of all the sin that's in between you and him. Everybody that you did wrong, Zacchaeus, is standing between you and me, and there's no, you are too short. You have fallen way below the line to get to me, Zacchaeus. That's right, run up to the crowd, just keep coming. That's the state of mankind right there. You can see him as Zacchaeus starts running ahead of the crowd. That's right, keep going, keep going, slow down. There's, climb the tree, that's the right tree right there, the sycamore tree. Climb that tree. You see Zacchaeus starting to run and climb a tree. And he says, that's right. That's right. If any man shall come unto me, let him deny himself. Don't worry about your own image right now, Zacchaeus. Let him deny himself. Let you humble yourself. Right there, Zacchaeus. That's the picture of mankind. 
You can't approach me. Now you need to humble yourself. Deny yourself. Take up thy cross and follow me, Zacchaeus. Let's bring it down. Climb that tree. It's a hypocrite tree. That's the picture we need, Zacchaeus. When Zacchaeus says, I want to pay back fourfold, that's the right amount. That's the amount I need the whole world to know you paid back, Zacchaeus. You can see Jesus smile each time one of these details happen. But there's one more detail that I want to address this morning, and it's in verse 10. It's one that people miss all the time. Verse 10, it says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, it seems like a simple statement that anyone would easily understand, but it goes much deeper than face value. I decided to go ahead and look up the words of this verse because I was all intrigued by all these other details that are happening in the story of Zacchaeus. Now, let's go ahead and go to verse 10 and see what details are there, too. So I started looking at the details in there, and I got to the word lost. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The word lost here does not mean something that has been misplaced. A lot of times what we do is we see the word lost as being misplaced. We were lost, but Jesus found me, as if we were misplaced. But that's not what the word lost means. That's not what it means here. The word lost here means to be destroyed, as in a lost cause. You were totally annihilated totally destroyed we were done so let's go behind the scenes just a little bit farther and see what's really happening in the story of Zacchaeus let me let me just open this up a little bit farther so we can see why all of this took place in the first place if you were to come up to me and threaten to hurt me suddenly you have made things personal everybody agree with that it has become personal that you choose to attack me we are on a personal level we're not getting along well you want to hurt me, it's become personal. But if you were to somehow attack my wife and children, personal just became, just started falling under a brand new definition. You're going to see a side of me that nobody's got to see before. I love my wife and children, and I would give my life for them. You attack me, that's one thing. You attack the people I love, it's a, it opens up a brand new feeling altogether. That's deep personal. But if there was a way that you could hurt my wife and kids by my hand, that would be the cruelest thing you could possibly do. Not only come after me, not only come after the ones I love, but figure out a way that I have to hurt the ones I love. Now that is an extent of cruelty that I can't imagine. That would hurt me deeper than anything you could possibly do. That's exactly what happened years before this story ever occurred. If you look in Isaiah chapter 14, what we have is the picture of Satan being kicked out of heaven. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be God. And God kicks him out of heaven because of his pride and his sin. He kicks him out of heaven. And what does Satan want to do? I want to hurt God. He just wants to hurt God. But how do you hurt? How do you hurt God Almighty? How can you hurt God? How do you attack God personally? So what does Satan do? He goes after the ones he loves. Yeah, God, I want to hurt you, but I got to make it more personal than that. I'm going to go after the ones you love. And I'm going to introduce sin into the world. I can't make them sin, but I can tempt them to sin. I'm going to tempt them to sin, and then sin's going to come into the world, and it's, I'm going to hurt the ones you love. But Satan decided to take it one step farther than that. I want you to hurt the ones you love. God, you hurt them. Now, how in the world can you do that? He went after God's character. God is love. He loved Adam and Eve. He loves mankind. Every individual, he loves us. How do you hurt them? Bring sin into their life and they will, they will be hurt. How do you make God hurt them? Because Satan knew God's character. He is love and he is righteous. And sin must be punished. Because God is a righteous judge. And he has to punish sin. And Satan knew God is righteous and he has to punish sin. I want to pull out a few verses here. He knew the character of God. And he knew he was going to have to pour his own wrath out on the people that he loved. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. 
In John 3, 36, it says, He that believed on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Which means it stays on him. We were dead. Once we were born as a sinner, we were lost for all eternity because God had to hurt us. When you were saved, you were not saved from hell. You were saved from the wrath of God. Open that up for a second and look at that. God knew he was going to have to judge you. He knew he was going to have to judge you and punish you by his own hand. He knew he was going to have to do that to the people that he loved. This is where love crashes through Satan's plan altogether. And it's displayed in most, the most sacrificial action that heaven or earth has ever known. God poured his wrath out on his own son. The wrath of God was coming for you and me. Satan not only hurt God, he hurt the ones he loved. And then he says, God, you hurt them with your own hand. You pour your own wrath out on your own children or on your own creation. You judge them. Now Satan only has to step out of the picture and let what he knows is going to happen, happen. God hurt them. I don't only want to hurt them, I want you to hurt them. Pour your wrath out on your own children or on your own creation. We're children of God once we get saved. We're creation of God from the start. Pour your own wrath out on them. Well, Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It says we are saved from wrath, not saved from hell. Hell is an attribute of that wrath. But he says God had to hurt you. God had to judge you righteously because sin and God cannot go together. The crime has to be punished. And God was going to have to pour his own wrath out on you and on me. And Jesus Christ says, wait, I want to stand in front of the, own, the, the very vehicle I am driving. My wrath, God's wrath is coming your way and I'd like to be the one to stand in front of it. And God poured his own wrath out on his own son. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. He stood in front of his own wrath. And God poured his own wrath out on his own son. Zacchaeus understood there was no way for him to get to God. He was doomed, just like you and I were doomed, or are doomed. There was no hope for us to get to heaven. God's wrath was our future, and we are doomed. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That is, there is nothing more final than death in a human understanding. There is nothing more final than death. Once you die, it's over. There's nothing that, you don't come back from that. So what does God say in, ver, in Ephesians 2.1? And you he hath quickened, which means to be made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, you were doomed. You were doomed. It was over. There is nothing you can do to get to God. From the first breath you took, you were doomed. Jesus came back from life. Doomed. Jesus came back to life from a lost cause. You don't come back from death. Nobody comes back from death. And Jesus Christ made a beautiful picture. You know that situation that you and I are in? We're doomed, we're lost, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Jesus stood up in that grave and said, Now, I just had all of that poured out on me. I can save you if you will just accept the gift that I have given you. I took all the pain. I paid the entire price. All I needed you to do was accept what I just did for you. A lot of times we say, say, I'm saved, I can't lose it, so I can live this life for myself. We do whatever we want to because we know we have God's salvation and we know we can't lose it. So why live detail by detail? Why try to draw people to his side? Why should we do that? Can you picture God saying this? I saved you from my wrath. I poured it on my own son. 
what did you do with that? Because one day we are going to stand in front of him. And that's basically what he's going to tell us. I saved you from my own wrath and I poured it all on him who didn't deserve any of it. What did you do with that gift? What did you do with it? Zacchaeus came standing face to face with the one who was about to jump in front of the bullet for him and he understood the grace of God in a way that we have a hard time comprehending. The word lost, it was over. We were doomed, we were done. But Jesus Christ allowed the wrath of God to be poured on him and he took your place and he took my place. What an amazing gift of God. What are you going to do with it, Christian? Are you living a life to let the other people out there know that are not saved, they're still lost? Are you living a life to let them know the wrath of God was your state also? And now you're living a life in fourfold back to them. It's just going to make a huge picture to the lost people out there when you live a life that's above and beyond so they can see God living through you. Are you doing that or are you just sitting down saying, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly? Is that all we're doing? Saying, Jesus, come back. Or are we doing something to be a light to the people out there? If you are not saved here this morning, that is exactly what God did for you. The wrath of God was poured out on his own son to take your place. And I'm telling you, if you're not saved here this morning or if you're watching our program on television and you are not saved, today you must come down from that tree because today is the day of salvation. He wants to save you today. Detail by detail. What is so important? You were. You were are what was so important. So important that God poured His own wrath on His own Son. Are you living a life that seems to be grateful to that extent for what He did for you? Have you accepted Jesus Christ into your life? Think about those things. You were so important. Stand with me this morning. Son left his father's home and with his wealth seeking earthly fame the world he did wrong soon he had lost everything that he had and with the swine he had to be so he went back to his father's house and cried lord have mercy on me
Lazarus, he was laid in the tomb, and how Martha cried because she thought his life was through, but then along came Jesus, and when he spoke that great command, well, Lazarus came forth, for he had been touched, and he lived once again. Day of Pentecost, gathered in one accord, his disciples were kneeling there. They were praying to the Lord. Oh, but suddenly they heard a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Well, it filled everyone, for they had been touched by God's almighty hand. I've been touched. Singing about my man from Galilee since I touched. I'm not in the same. Oh, my spirit has washed my sins away. My nights have all been turned to day. Yes, I've been touched. Oh, praise his name. Well, I've been touched. Well, since I've been the same. 